Hi there and a very warm welcome to this week's video in which we'll get a little bit nerdy and learn how to synthesize point data into UV maps. So this was helping me with my strings project and this is therefore the unofficial part 3, but it is useful for a lot of cases. So without further ado, let's see what we're doing, grab your coffee and let's keep going. Welcome to our preview section. So I have the Alembic here for one of our strands. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can find the knitting video in the upper right corner. It's a two-part series. Though even if you don't know about it, you should be able to follow this along nicely. So what is this about? When I shaded this thread here, I noticed that the UVs are not following along its animation nicely. This is of course best shown when played. So let's play back a part here. And you can see this is starting and stopping the flow and it's looking rather weird. Of course I did some research and the best way to get to the root of the problem is to simplify your project. So this is just a static spline that I cloned into a sweep so you can see the spline and the sweep at the same time. Now if I move some points the same way that the knitting animation would, you can see that the UVs are stretched over the whole spline here. So the UVs are taken from here and move towards where they are stretched most. So what we have here is not a point based UV space, but a average over the whole length of the spline by making the UVs as less stretched as possible. And this in our case leads to the unwanted results. So we have to find a method to apply the UVs to the actual points. So when the original string stretches, then we only get stretching in the part that is enlarged. Now the whole explanation before was necessary to come to this reveal. This is my prototype shader here and you can see if I now move the spline, only the parts that we are moving are actually stretching. If you now say that's a little bit edgy, the spline I mean, then what we can do is go to the B spline that I always like and then go for the interpolation with natural. And natural is the only thing that works. If we do, for example, uniform and then move the points, you can see we get some movement in the UVs again. But if we go with natural, then we are golden. By the way, this whole approach works best if the spacing between the points on the spline is rather regular. So for this tutorial, what we are going to do is create this formula that then affects our vertex map to create a gradient along the spline which we then are going to use to replace the v-coordinate of our UV system. I told you this is going to be nerdy, hopefully you are here to see this through. By the way, as incentive, at the end there is an amazing bonus that might blow your mind. Welcome to the creation phase and formula land. So let's get started right away by creating the vertex map by going to other tags and then vertex map and inside of there create a formula field. Now as always this is creating a sine wave and if we flap this open you can see some of the variables we can use. Let's delete everything and write id in there and everything is turning white. To make this a little bit understandable let's show you what ids are and why only this one point here is black. To get access to the structure manager which shows our ids we need to convert our object into a polygon. So then we have access to the structure manager here and we can see each point gets a number. And this is the exact number our formula field is translating into our vertex map. And since only one point has a number of zero, it's black. And the second one is already white and then we have two times as white, three times as white and so on. To get everything into a visible range, there is a neat trick. We can use the count for that. So the ID divided by the count is then giving us black to white values along the spline. But if you watch closely again, there's something we don't like and this is a circular manner here. So if we go to our sweep and to our structure again and move down here, you can see that one segment always goes in a circular manner and then jumps to the next one. For our UVs to work, we need one whole segment as one value and not different ones as we have right now. Since we want to keep everything procedural, let's go back until we get our sweep nerves again. Here we go. 
Let's set the formula back to ID and then let's have a think what we can do to cluster all the points of one segment into a single value. The method we are going to use is rounding values, but in order to round we need decimal places. Right now we have one, two, three, four. We need each segment to be in the decimal places between two whole numbers. What we need for that in order to work is the amount of points in each segment. And luckily we have the sweep here, so the end side here tells us that and we have 10 points. So what we need to do is go to our formula field and divide the ID by 10. Unfortunately, I don't know a nice way to display that, but if we turn on our mesh mode, we don't have points 0, 1, 2, 3, but 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 until 0 0.9 and then 2.0 is on the next segment. Our rounding function to reduce this all to one value is the floor function and it's written as it's called F-L-O-O-R and then a parentheses open and a parentheses closed. And now you can see we have a black value at the beginning, then we have a value of one and a value of two and so on. Alrighty, almost there. To get the black to white range, we need to divide the whole formula by the number of segments, not by the number of points. We could do the math in our head, but we could also go and get another formula in here. So we divide everything by the count divided by the same number that we divided our ID by, so 10. And now if we zoom out, we have done it. We have now our gradient along the spline. And if you now say, wait a minute, the formula you showed before was way more complex, then you are totally right. This was a formula for multi-segment splines. So for now, let's just stay with that and keep it easy. And welcome to Octaneland. So what we need to do here to see something is to create a material in which we are going to shift around the UVs. So we just need a diffuse material because this is all we need to see something. Let's call it UV replace and then bring in, you guessed it, a UV map. Of course, we need to assign it to the spline here and then we see something. As default, Octane is using the UVs of the sweep nerve. So if we go and select one point of the spline again, we can see we have the same problem as before. Now, if you watched my texture to UVW node tutorial, upper right corner if you're interested, you know where this is going. To refresh your memories, let's bring in a UV coordinate node and plug it into the diffuse. Here we go. So this is how a UV map looks behind the curtain, but we can go even deeper by getting a channel picker and then move it into the stream here. And if we go close, you can see we picked the red channel, which is the same as the U coordinate, and we see it's around the tube. This is also the channel we don't mind and can keep, whereas the green channel, which is the V coordinate, is the gradient along the spline. Please ignore for now that the gradient is going in the other direction. We can fix that later. What we want to do is exchange this gradient with our vertex map. And you all know what this means. At least I hope so. It's attributing time. Let's get the attribute node in here. Let's disable the preview and then drag in the vertex map. Since this is a vertex map and not a vertex color, we need to set it to float. And then if we plug it into the diffuse, we can see the gradient. Here we go. Alrighty, now that we have all the components, let's get this thing going. To do so, let's plug in the UV map again. Then we need a way to get the texture data back in our UVs. And yes, I spoiled that before. We need to go into the projection, then go to the projection and set the XYZ to UVW. Just checking if you're still listening. Actually, we need the color to UVW. As the nodes multiply like rabbits, it's best to turn on snapping because that will keep them in check and tidy. So as said, what we want to do is bring the UVs in the U channel and then our gradient in the V channel. To do that, we need another node, which is the channel merger. And this one goes directly into the texture input. Here we go. When I pre-built the shader, I noticed that you can plug in the UVs directly into the red channel and it wouldn't work with the attribute texture here. So what we need to do is go through a green filter here 
And then if we do so, the UVs should pop up in our shader. And here you go, you can see it's working. Before we end this chapter with some fine tuning as reversing the gradient, let's see if this actually works by going to the spline and moving the point. And yes, you can see it works nicely. Getting the vertex map inverted is as easy as it sounds. We just have to drop in a invert node in between the vertex map and the channel. And there you can see we now have successfully inverted it. Also, in our first preview, I have repeated the UV map five times along the spline. To do so, it's also just mathematical operations. What we need to do is getting a multiply. So here we go. Disable the preview black it in and then find a float texture, also black that in and set it to, you guessed it, 5. And that's already it for the main part. As you can see on the screen right now, we have some UVs that are sticking to our splines and not moving around, therefore fixing our problem with sliding textures. I hope you find that nerdy enough that it gives you some ideas. Now. While I tinkered around with this, I found out something really nice, which is the upcoming Super Mega Bonus right now. And welcome to the bonus sphere. While working on the project, trying out different UV setups, I thought maybe it's a good idea to use fields to generate UV maps. And there's actually one map that can hold it all, and this is the vertex color. Let's bring in the attribute texture again and then this time link the vertex color and we don't have to do anything because it's already set to color. Of course, if that counts as doing something, we can disable the preview. Now, you can't see anything in here and this is because there's no data, everything is black. So let's give it some data by adding a linear field. And this creates those funny looking UVs and basically it's a random color so we want to turn it pure red because X or the U coordinate of the UVs is always red. Let's call it X for the X axis. Elon Musk likes that. And then repeat the process for Y. So another linear field. Instead of red, we are going with a green color. So pure green. And also make it additive to make red and green exist at the same time. And then call it Y. Last but not least, what we need to do is also orient it in the y-axis. Octane needs a nudge, so let's turn it on and off. And here we go, we have a UV coordinate system. Now, I hear you say, that's cool and all, but where's the groundbreaking revelation? And I answer to that, let's keep going. Vertex color and yet another linear field. Make it blue for set or the last component of the UV space, which is the W coordinate. Also make it additive and call it set. Let's give Octane another nudge and you can see the original UV set hasn't changed. But you know there's one texture that uses the W coordinate and this is the noise. So let's bring out a Octane noise and plug it in here. And you can see it actually has seams because it's now using the UV coordinates. But if we plug in the projection here, you can see now it's 3D. Well, sort of because we forgot one thing to actually go to the set here and turn it to set. And now it's really 3D. I still hear you say, well, you could have done that by using a XY set to UVW. And to this point, you're right. But the mind bending thing is the next step. So if we go to our vertex colors again and go down here, what we actually can do is use a freeze to freeze those fields. So now we have frozen the 3D coordinates to our noise. What this means is that we could take a deformer here, for example, a bend, and then bend the object. And you can see the noise is actually 3D and moves with the object. So basically the reveal here is that we created a rest position pass using fields and this is seamless and integrates with the octane noise. So we can do whatever we want with our object once we bake down the XYZ coordinates with a freeze. And I think 
that is a thumbs up. Now, to be fair, among other features, Otoy is releasing its own native resposition pass here, but until then, I think this is a very valid approach. And this is it, the super mega bonus, hopefully you found it as interesting as I did. Small announcement here, I'm not sure how many tutorials I'm able to make in the following weeks, especially at the end of October, because I'm visiting Blender Conference. So expect some holes in my usual schedule. And now, without further ado, let's thank those people who made this video possible. Of course, my Patreons. Especially my 50 Euro tier subscribers, Chiels Augustinen, Just a Frickin, and Leon Studio TV. Also, of course, a huge thank you for my 15 Euro tier subscribers, for the thieves. Render King, Alessandro Bonchio, Alessio De Vecchi, BVR, Chris Fritschi, Christian Grajewski, Erbe Plus Academy, George Luna, Graham Bagnell, James Conkel, Joel Mackemer, John Edward, Muratan Axos, Nico Straub, Part 1 of 2, Quark and Dang, Ralph, Random Capibara, Raiko, Renato Marquez, Reshock, Shamos Johnson, Shiro2049, Terry Wayne Ranson, and Yasin Rupp. Thank you all so very much for making it possible to produce those videos that you all enjoy. A very warm after show party welcome to my UV explorers. After last week's debacle where I didn't check if the emoticons were actually available on YouTube, for some reason the only one that got that working was Paddy from the render network. Huge kudos to him. I really don't know how he did that. This week to please the algorithm overlords and help me, and believe me, this time I've checked, let's post a red, green and blue circle in the comments down below. Thank you so much for always watching this bit, it's really a nice thing to have. And now, without further ado, I wish you a fantastic start into the week, if you're watching this later, simply an amazing time, and I'm closing this off by saying, happy field testing. Bye.